Yeah, sounds good. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. Our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking with your friends. Please visit our website at wearelibertarians.com for all of our other shows. This is a special series on We Are Libertarians called The Swamp Explained. I'm joined by Rob Cortell, who is a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C. Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate, and he's spent years working in the private technology sector, working with startup companies. Given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us a great insight into the swamp that makes up our nation's capital. And just in general, how does politics work and how do people in positions of authority think about things, which I think is on the mind of everybody right now. Rob, thanks for coming on. Well, I mean, for being a co-host on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where else can we go, Chris? I, I have been doing so many <laughs> interviews that I, I <laughs> just get stuck in your brain. Uh, well, I've I've been doing podcasts from like five from uh, nine in the morning until five at night, and uh, I get so tired of them. I just cannot wait for my drink. <laughs> what, <laughs> what other podcasts are you doing? Where can no, I just but well, not podcasts, Zooms, Zoom oh, conferences. Zoom. Yeah, these yeah, are the yeah. worst. Uh, some of these have to be the worst shows you've ever watched in your life. <laughs> uh, and it, of course, it's just amazing. You and I were talking before we went on about people who can who figured out Zoom and people who haven't. You, you made the remark that you thought you'd never have to explain Zoom to anybody else again, but I, I don't think I believe that. Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, th there is an aspect, because I've done podcasting for almost 15 years. And so for the last 15 years, if you have somebody on, like we had Noam Chomsky on once and like Zoom was out of the question. At, at, then it was Skype. Yeah. You, know, you have Walter Block on, who's a 60 something economist, you know, you're you're kind of walking them through how to set that stuff up or you're just going onto the phone and i never have to do that again everybody now in their life this is great you know it, it's yeah. perfect because now everybody can just pop up and they know how to do a zoom so except there are still um i, I do think there are some interesting things around zoom so you know the security issues which um, you know they i think they've dealt with myself uh, both in terms of the protocols and the technology but but there are, you know, the government basically is now not letting, at various levels, not letting uh, people use Zoom. Uh, and hmm. is, in some cases, um, they will not let them use. Um, so, so, for example, I'm on a couple of boards uh, here in Virginia, one at the state level and one, um, a local uh, uh, growth, you know, related thing here. And none of them can use Zoom. So they use um, just conference calls. And I, mm. I must say, it feels incredibly technologically um, archaic. Um, and and notwithstanding <laughs> the, the, the fact that I get really tired of eight hours of Zooms every day, um, it, it is so much better to see people and yeah. to be able to try to, you know, get some kind of a connection that way. So, and I'm sure all of our listeners are experiencing all of the same things. So. Yeah. So you're telling me the people that run nuclear weapons off of floppy disks and VA that. That's right. No they <laughs> that, that's right. They can't use Zoom. <laughs> yeah. It is funny because that, you know, people, it's funny what people grab onto. Like there was that article about how Zoom's not safe and a friend, their school, uh, w their school sent out a mandate, do not record any of the sessions because hackers might break in. And you're like, hackers don't care about your, yeah, yeah. your they don't want to hear 15 t kids being taught. They, they're they trying to break into Mark Zuckerberg's Zoom to, to learn trade secrets. It is funny. Like, yeah. But I want to, I wonder, because you are in the technology space and the the kind of transition to work from home and this kind of telemedicine, tele, telecommuting, all that has been on the gradual slope up. But yeah. this is a huge acceleration. I mean, if you watch CNBC, they all say the one place that's never going to recover is com consumer re uh, commercial real estate. Because if hmm. productivity drops 5%, then why, why pay for the, for the retail space? I mean, so yeah. after this, do you think that there is a mass switch to telecommuting like this? Or do people just like to be in person and talk and that will never change? Well, you, I think there are a couple issues to unpack in that. One is technology, one is um, uh, sociology and, 
and uh, and one is as you say real estate. So um, just in terms of uh, the technology, I, I think I think it's it is a huge breakthrough. I think you're correct that more and more and more people in business and all that will be transacted and people will be more comfortable with it. It's not just government, by the way, that's still uncomfortable. So my wife is on a couple boards uh, there. They don't use it. Um, you know, they have board packages and things, but of course they're also, frankly, they're afraid of being hacked. Uh, the fix to that was that you can invite people in and control that and have moderators for larger groups and all that. So, but, um, but I, I think there's no question that, um, a, a lot more business is going to be transacted on uh, Zoom, and I certainly see it in the tech community. Um, I see it um, in in just about everything uh, you know that affects us in a daily life. And uh, secondly, um, but on real estate, I actually think there's a big opportunity there. You know, you know my companies operate out of a WeWork in Tyson's Corner, Northern Virginia, both tech companies, and. Um, I actually think there's a big opportunity there for we work to to rebrand as a safe space. If you could, you know, if they could have temperature, you know, gauges. There, there's a temperature visual you can take at the door, and you fill out a thing that says I haven't been exposed, and and um, and you, if you can make it a safe space, actually, I think people would would come back, particularly if you brand it that way. And I, you know, I don't know what you you feel, but personally, I do miss seeing a lot of people in, in the flesh. Um, I, I miss restaurants. I miss, uh, you know, uh, in some ways, my life is a lot more uh, uh, rigid and stressful right now because, not because of COVID, but just because I am scheduled all day long. And I used to do business meetings at breakfast, lunch, and cocktails. And you can't do that now. Now I got to turn it in a damn Zoom conference. So <laughs> yeah, there, there have been days where I'm like, I have worked so much harder. And that oh, it, it's true. Yeah, and part of it is that I'm able to get, and I've basically been told like, prepare to work from home for the rest of the year. Oh, um, yeah. Which I, you know, it's hard to do creative work when you're not in the room with people. Like there, there's yeah. there's something about you know, vibing off of people face to face that you, you get in a creative industry that you don't get elsewhere. But I am more productive because there aren't wasted hours of conversation with people in my office or me in the, the break room, just chatting it up with people. But then you start to miss that stuff. And I drove on the interstate yesterday for the first time in two, three weeks. And I was like, I miss driving. And then I got gas. And I was like, I want to go in and get a Mountain Dew. And I can't do that because there's a sign that says I'm not allowed to. And so, <laughs> I think once we kind of get to a reopening, there's going to be uh, that hunger to return to the life that you've, I've spent 36 years doing the same things. You know, my ent entire adult life are going out, driving, getting gas, going in and using the restroom. Like I had to go to the restroom big time. I like, I had to, I, my bladder was full and I couldn't go anywhere because all the inside <laughs> were closed. If you'd had that empty Mountain Dew bottle, you could <laughs> Exactly <use that>. right. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like those weird little things that, that, that stink. Yeah. But I, I really think that this has been, I did a show at the very beginning of it, mid March, where I talked about how it was a good opportunity to reconnect with what was important uh, to us. And I think that, that, that this has been good for me and that I'm, I'm not as focused on the consumerism, you know, and, yeah. and I'm sitting here at certain points going, I'm really enjoying the evenings where I'm just sitting there and doing whatever or going for walks or reading and it's slow and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know to have great relationships with people and, and I'm, I missed out on so much of that the last couple of years, especially because I've been so focused on work and money, like getting money to buy more stuff. And this has kind of broken that wheel for me. And I think for a lot of other people where, where you go, that consumerism isn't as important to me. And so that's why I don't think you're going to have a V because a V shape recovery, because people aren't going to go back to the same things that they were going back to. I think there is going to be a part of the workforce like me that is going to go, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to work as hard as at these certain things because I want to go have time to walk with my kids at the end of the day, you know? So I well, think, yeah, but, but think about though, but think about consumer behavior. 
um, a little bit more. Um, I don't know about you, but I get bombarded all day long, 10 times a, a minute by ads. Um, yeah. If I have just zipped across some ad. Well, in these I, uncertain I, I, times, Rob. Yeah. Yes, of course. And I <laughs> click on something and, uh, and don't buy it. It comes back at me for three days straight, every 15 <laughs> minutes, uh, you know. And, um, and I, I will say, I know, and obviously we're all buying more online and, and I'm out here in, on an island in a rural area. And I think my wife and I have probably quintupled the amount of the entire county's um, FedEx and UPS and, <laughs> and all that. <laughs> and she's, she's uh, as one of, the, one of the delivery guys said to her, she, he, as he dropped a big box of wine off, probably the fifth you know, uh, case of wine he dropped off in the last two weeks, um, he said, so some more uh, COVID supplies, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, and, I, and I must say, I think I probably am buying more than I would normally buy, partly out of boredom, periodically it comes across. So, mm. uh, and, and I will say my daughter, who is, uh, heads the digital co uh, companies for a digital strategy and businesses for a major uh, consumer brand, she, uh, her, her quarter, she's up like, a gazillion percent. I'm sure I can't say exactly what it is, but, um, you know, so all of those and that's coming, you know, a lot of that's coming back. The Chinese consumers are coming online. Asian consumers are coming. And, and of course, all of us are sitting at home. Then that the problem is going to be, as you say, in the physical real estate, how do people reinvent themselves? And, and I think there will be a lot of reinvention, you know, Neiman Marcus is probably going to go bankrupt uh, this week, I think. And, and several others have, and um, uh, but but you know people are creative, and it's it's uh, I, again I I just think people want um, to actually see other people at some level and and uh, create experiences, and it's it's only one dimensional you on a screen. Yeah. I can see you there, Chris, but. It was more fun riding with you in the car during a snowstorm a year and a half ago. Yeah. We are, <laughs> and, and talking. <laughs> right. We are still the same animal we were 10,000 years ago. Like there's right. still, you know, and that's, that's part of why the internet is a blessing and a curse because you get to see the, the animal brain so often yeah. on that's comment right. threads. But, uh, and yeah, but I get it. I get that this has been a huge disruption. And I think there are people that I personally talk to online that I saw, you know, I recognize the names because they're repeated commenters and it's been funny to watch them go from this is all fake, this is a hoax, yeah. to, you know, the numbers don't add up on the thing that is a hoax, to now I'm fighting for the unemployed, to now yeah. it's back to a hoax because the models right. didn't add up. It, and so there's, I think it's, let's talk about the protests a little bit in the reopening yeah. because yeah. On, on the one hand, I, I look at the protests and, and, and I understand totally the the impulse to have the protest. I don't understand the impulse in the way that the protests are done. Like, I I firmly believe that the coronavirus pandemic is real and that it is dangerous, that if I get it, it's probably not going to kill me, but it also could kill someone that is vulnerable that I come in, into contact with. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm making choices to stay home. Like I said, I hadn't driven... I've only gone to three locations in the last two and a half, two months or whatever. Um, so when people invited me to come to the protest at the state house where a few hundred people showed up, I mean, it's three to 500 people. Um, I, there was no chance I was going to go wade into that Petri dish. Like there, right. you know, but I get why people are upset and I understand that I understand the message. So I'm not, I'm not, um, you look at the media and they're kind of just not getting what they're talking about. They're, they're mad about the unemployed. They're mad at the government for the shutdown. They're, I think there's a little bit of gray left, not in there that in my mind, the protesters are right that the shutdown in certain businesses was more severe had it just <laughs> gone on. Right. Like right. there's no real, epidemiological reason that a liquor store should be open but a floor should be closed it's just oh, oh excuse me yeah Which, right it, it's a it's an internal uh, um uh, um you know cleanser sort of like lysol <laughs> right but if you walk <laughs> into a liquor store it's the same size and the floors it's just the liquor store has better uh, lobbyists and so the, it gets a 
and then you get the tamping down of people on beaches and Walmart not being able to sell seeds and, and it gets to a ridiculous level. And so that spurs the protests. So I'm not against the protest, although I think like in Israel where they had like a six foot rule, it was a beautiful photograph or Michigan where they stopped traffic with cars. Like I wish it had been done more responsibly because I think it makes us look bad. It makes us all look like we're Looney Tunes when we don't respect biology. And yeah. it sort of pushes the message of if the government didn't exist, I was going to do the wrong thing anyways, which is not a great, great look. So what were your impressions? Of well, so, so some of that is, uh, again, you and I have discussed a little bit of this, the differential geography. So, you know, I live in a county with 8,000 people on the shore of the Chesapeake Bay. We had two cases, a husband and a wife, um, who got sick but not weren't hospitalized um, about six weeks ago. And so that meant they were exposed uh, probably two weeks earlier than that. So it's uh, April something, February, anyway, back in February. Um, uh, the county, the several counties around have had only a handful of cases. Um, uh, nevertheless, about, this is a commuting workforce. Uh, my county has out of uh, 8,500 8, people, roughly 8,000, 8,500, only has about 1,200 kids in K through 12. So it's very small population, much older. Obviously, target um, high levels of obesity, um, people smoke, uh, you know, a typical rural area. And um, I, I would go to the grocery store here locally once a week, and I'm, carry, I'm wearing a mask, you know, and I go in and and I am the only pe person in the store wearing a mask, but for some young woman who's maybe 25 years old. And uh, the, the employees aren't wearing them. I asked one employee why she wasn't. She said, well, I know I should, but it's uncomfortable. And besides, nobody here has it. And uh, yet this is a county where 40% of the workforce commutes south to Newport News to the shipyard and those associated industries. And, and where they commute to is where um, is one of the hot spots in Virginia, mm. uh, Hampton Roads, Newport News, Jamestown, uh, James County, Williamsburg area, and and some of that is because again it's it's people who travel. They're military, a lot of military people, a lot of well-heeled retirees. And one of the communities was a retirement community, and obviously that became a hot spot. Interestingly, not a not a home, but a community. And so I am. Uh, I just uh, and then. To amuse myself, I I would every so often, once a month, drive an hour south to um, Whole Foods, and I go in there. And for the last six weeks, they've been wiping down the carts. People are wearing masks. Most of the checkers were not all of them until this last weekend, and most of the shoppers were wearing masks. And and everybody's keeping social distancing. And and I think everybody's probably noticed in the grocery stores, uh, although not everybody obeys it, just like protesters. Um, there are one way, one way direction signs in your grocery store now. If you know, we can't get home delivery of groceries out here, so we right. actually have to go get them and go pick them out. Um, but um, so you know, in that grocery store, I, I, some guys, you know, older than I am, comes up close to me with his cart, and I put mine between the two of us, and he said, says, uh, "Well, I'm not worried. We're in X County. I'm not going to name the name, but uh, you've probably heard me talk about it before." And uh, I'm, we're not going to get it. I'm 75 anyway. And I said, well, I hope you make it to 76. And part of me was thinking, <laughs> I hope you get a mild case. But I, I didn't really. Um, uh, you re really wouldn't want to wish that on anyone. But so I do think uh, you made the point earlier that different kinds of businesses and different kind of, but it's also geographies. And, you know, I don't know what your county is like and your city state, you know, what kind of building you're in. I'm, I'm sitting out here on six acres and you know, I, there are a couple of friends that we like to see in small doses and everybody's very careful. And I go out and walk a mile and a half to the post office pretty much every day and whip my bandana out when I get into the post office and I use a plastic bag to open the door because, you know, that's the most visited place on the island. So you're right. I do think there, there, there is a natural tendency for people to, particularly in similar circumstances to this, who haven't seen a lot of it to believe that it's not going to affect them. And, and yeah. come on, let's get this over with. I, I think I'm in a position where I, my mom's a nurse and she works at an outpatient surgery center. She's had a cushy position for 25 years. 
and she's been called to the ICU. She's caring for COVID patients. She's working probably with, scared to death every minute. Working, yeah, she's scared to death. They're all terrified of it. And because they're seeing it, they're touching it, they're, they're around it, they're watching people die. And so I have that perspective. Um, and, well, and now the researchers keep discovering new, uh, new uh, conditions that come out of it. I mean, like just recently, they're now seeing a number of young people dying from essentially strokes, hmm. getting blood clots. So that's the latest, uh, you know, out of the research. Yeah, there's the six new uh, symptoms added today by the yeah. CDC. Right. So, so I get, I get that there are a portion of people who have to see something to believe it, touch it, feel it, sense it, for, before they understand it. But those are the same people who, who were, would have gone to those protests who are sharing with me that Sweden did it differently. Why didn't we do it that way? Well, if you read anything about Sweden and talk to Swedes like A-I-E-R wrote a great article from a Swedish libertarian. And he's like, everyone here is taking it super responsibly. They're being responsible for themselves. They're taking it seriously. They're doing the right things. Like that's what's going to be required. Like freedom still carries responsibilities. And you didn't really see the government start to act until St. Patrick's Day when it looked like everybody was going to stay open. And yeah. that's when they acted. And so if if you're not leading the charge to be responsible then it's you're going to end up with 80 i mean here in indiana 80 percent of the state thinks that governor holcomb did the right thing with these shutdown orders only 17 percent of people disagree and so it's it's hard to yeah it, it's hard to take seriously somebody who clearly doesn't and i don't know we're kind of painting with a broad brush but they're you talk to a lot of the people that went to the protests they're not going to act responsibly. They never were going to act responsibly. And I just think that's a poor message. But I do appreciate that they are having these rallies because I don't think that a lot of these governors would open up if it weren't for that pressure. I think they are giving voice to the very real underreported voice of frustration at government policies, but also just the situation itself. Well, you, you have in any group of 50 performers or 50 anything, um, a, a variety of performances. And so if you think about the governors as a bell curve and how they're gonna handle this, they're gonna be a couple down at the, the, the low end of, uh, of uh, what appears to be low end of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, most of those seem to be in the South where I am. And then, um, and also in my party, unfortunately, and then you have um, some at the far end who are going to be overreacting the other direction. And then, but you know, the vast majority are going to be in center there. You know, in, in, in all of these demonstrations, I think the governors have by and large uh, been the hands off. I think they've, you know, they've done it in a way that allowed them to protest and come out. And, uh, but I have to believe that, um, that the local, um, uh, I, I can't believe that the feedback any of these protesters are getting from other people is is very happy. You know, there's obviously will be some people who are tired of it, but, but you know, here we go in Georgia, which by all accounts, almost everyone, including the president agrees, has opened up too early. Um, and you have restaurant tours and, and people running uh, tan, tanning salons and, and uh, tattoo parlors, they can all go back to work, but you know, some number clearly are not going to go by their own volition because they're worried about both themselves and their and the yeah, I, and and most especially about their own families. Yeah, and this is how it, in my mind, how it should have always been operated. It should have been the burden should have been on the individual. It should have been on the individual business, because realistically, the governor can tell you, "Hey, we'll threaten your license and make you shut down." But really, the the enforcement that Trump has, or the CDC has, or your governor has, isn't all that great. There's too many of us and not enough of them. And so it's always going to be, you look at some of the pork plants here in Indiana or in South Dakota having to shut down. Well, these are essential businesses that didn't necessarily operate in a responsible manner. And now they're going to suffer the consequences of not taking it seriously, which unfortunately puts our food supply in a lot of danger. And the more risk that people had to carry, the more important it would have been. But I think- Well, they, but, but they also put their employees in danger. And you know, the one of yeah. the plants had like 800 employees. and. And some number of those people will die. And um, so you, you, I would push back and say, this is where, you know, the, the, 
the company, you, you can say the company will pay the price. Well, no, those people will pay the price. And, um, and but aren't they, I mean, I'm seeing Daryl Isaacs, the hammer, the local attorney who has bought every billboard on the interstates mm -hmm. uh, running ads saying, if you're, if you have a liability situation around COVID, feel free to call me. I'd love to give you free advice. Like there. Yeah. It doesn't help if you're dead though. No, that's true. That's very true. But I think to, to the, my point is that the two grocery stores that you talked about, it yeah. always, it, from now on, from this moment on, it has to be about the individual's reaction, the individual's responsibility, the business's responsibility, and understanding that your, your choices really do affect other people's lives in this situation. Yeah, well, I, I think um, this, this is where the, the issue of reopening, I, I, would, I would agree with you more on the reopening issue that this is where individual business owners have to think through, you know, the, the micro impact of what their decision is. Do they do it now? Do they wait a little longer? You know, I see that a lot. And, but I, I think it would be, we would have had no, we, that would have been a hundred times worse if they had not issued stay at home orders for everyone. But um, we'll see, we'll see. Of course, remember what Tony Fauci said, our favorite um, uh, swamp monster, um, <laughs> my favorite, <laughs> the favorite of, the, of everybody's, uh, it said a long time ago, he said that, um, you know, if at the end of this, we look back and say we did too much to stop it, um, that's fine. That's still better than looking back and say we didn't do enough. And, and, and you know, that's a legitimate choice of positions. And uh, Yeah, I think it was the head of the Ohio, I think the Ohio Surgeon General or whatever, she, she's like, I think her quote was very similar to that. It was, you know, basically we're we're going to get hit no matter what we do like if we're going to be too over overreaching we're not going to yeah, have to that's right never and that's just part of being in a free society nobody's ever i think if you're a governor it has to be a tough choice trump recognized right. the choice he said it's the biggest decision he'll ever make because everybody's letting georgia go first as somewhat of a crazy horrible experiment to see what happens there and then they'll open up if it's all fine and they'll clamp down tighter if it doesn't and if you're a governor you have the very real risk of people getting hurt and you also have the risk of civil unrest you know if you don't because what these protesters are talking about is very real food banks are at their max unemployment is at its max these are very dangerous conditions so I think part of, the, to relate it back to the swamp, when you are in a position of leadership, it is very difficult to navigate these choices and to know what to do. And then on top of that, knowing that no, you're never gonna make everybody- No happy. matter what you do, it's gonna, yeah, you're gonna get blamed for it, so. Well, yeah, and of course, there are a lot of, um, and now, of course, who's gonna be the fall guy? We, now, this morning, we hear that Alex Azar, Secretary of HHS, is 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 uh, being pushed and of course he says he doesn't have time for this uh, beltway intrigue but uh, i think but, it's you know that's the first sign right yeah didn't his father just pass away from covid uh i don't know that that's terrible yeah. if that's true um yeah, yeah he's he but he kind of should be the fall guy <laughs> like if you read the last month in the new york times like you look at the cdc the fda yeah. like azar should be the fall guy he was in charge of those agencies yeah yeah yeah. So unfortunately, it, it elevates Peter Navarro to a level I can't stand. I, <laughs> my, one of my least favorite people on the planet. Why is that? I, I think he's, he's just, uh, he's a, he, he started life out as a, as a left winger. And now he's, he did this 180. And now I don't, I don't know how to call him a right winger, but he's now, he used to be a big free trade guy. Now he's a big anti-trade guy, anti this, anti that. Right. Of course, he's he's the biggest supporter inside the White House for the Jones Act. So you know how I feel about that. Ah, okay. And, and I, I I personally think he's an idiot. But he's the he, architect he, of the tariffs. He's really kind of yeah. He, he's 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 uh, uh, people I know who know him and who work with him uh, just think he is off the completely intellectually off the reservation. And that it's not because they think there's a single path, but uh, he. It just, it's ideological and all in its own way. But so anyway, but, the, but I, they're talking about Deborah Burks, you know, maybe as the next secretary. Ooh, well, congrats. Well, and let, the other person is, uh, is the me, woman who runs okay. Medicare. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of intellectually 
decrepit. Uh, let's talk about Trump and his responsibility because this, <laughs> this is the ultimate conversation on all the Swamp Monster shows this morning uh, as we record this on right. Sunday. Uh, so it's so Trump, and this is so typical of all of the, the Trump presidency. Trump vaguely hears something from someone somewhere that there's a way to yeah. disinfect the lungs or UV light kills the virus. And so he goes out like most of us do this. We vaguely hear something in the headlines and then we repeat it as if it's a fact. And then people go, I don't think that's true. Except the fact that he's the president of the United States and doesn't seem to recognize his own responsibility. And then you go, Hey, this thing that he said is incredibly stupid. And they go, well, that's not what he was there. The fake news is misquoting him. It's like, no, don't gaslight me. I literally watched it live. It wasn't taken out of context. Then the next day he says he was being sarcastic, which no, you weren't. And then all the people who said you heard the wrong thing go, it, it wasn't fake news. It's just CNN it took his joke out of, and it never, you, nobody ever goes. Now the conversation is stop airing the press conferences. It's not the press conferences that are the problem. It's the president. Like I've gone, from, <laughs> I've gone from give the guy the benefit of the doubt in January to I've watched all these press conferences and I can't believe how incredibly ill-equipped and dumb this person is. And I have full Trump derangement syndrome now because I've actually watched. <laughs> and so you just go, it isn't the press conferences. It isn't the fake news in this instance. He does get a raw deal, but he also doesn't go, if the press doesn't give me a raw deal, maybe I should speak more carefully. Like there's never any responsibility that he's held to. Nobody ever holds him accountable for what he says or doesn't says from within his own camp. It's truly bizarre. I don't get well, it, right. Yeah, well, well, you know, press conferences have been have their own long hundred year history, you know, mm. ups and downs and sideways and everything else and good press secretaries and bad. And, you know, and so you, you think about this. So Trump went, Trump w was so different during the campaign because, and one, partly because he was, he was available to the press and he said a lot of outrageous things, but he'd call up, they'd call up the show, he'd call up the left, he'd call up the right, he'd call up the reporter. Um, he always had a remark. Sometimes he disguised his voice. And then, and then all of a sudden, we didn't have any when he became president. So, you know, he, the onslaught. And, then, and now we, he's, he's uh, back to kind of that position. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tag you with a little pressitis here because, um, because uh, I, uh, I think that you, you're correct that he said what he said. But when I heard it, and you know, unfortunately, my wife and I have gotten this phase where we, like a lot of people, I'm afraid, we we uh, uh, we we finish our work, we get our drink, we sit down at five thirty, and we turn on M MSNBC or somebody else, and we watch the Trump show, and <laughs> until we can no longer stand it, and 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 um, and it, that it may be taken off the air, you know, if the ratings aren't good enough, I guess, but. Um, so we have been watching the press and watching Trump back and forth, and and my wife is dislikes him even more than I do. Accuse me of being an apologist, which I'm not. But yeah. but you know he, he, what Deborah Burks said, I think is probably correct. I think he is a guy with no governor. What she said was he was musing out loud, which is what he does. You are correct that he hears something, and he. He, his mouth goes into gear about that. Um, now, some people can muse out loud uh, carefully and objectively, and most of us don't do it in front of the National Press Corps. Um, so if that's his style and everything else, I, I get that. Um, I, I think it's unhelpful because between his musing out loud about the use of uh, disinfectant internally, and the press harping on it long enough, there are now people who are going to try to do it, and no. that is a that is a joint that is a joint outcome in my mind. It's not just because Trump said it; it's because the press has been playing over and over and banging and banging away at this drum, and um, that's you know they are they they aid each other. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure, I, I don't know if I said it last time, but th there's one of the reporters, I can't remember, this young woman reporter who just badgers every single time. And the last time after she 
interrupted him four times on a question. He said, enough. And I'm sitting there thinking, that's exactly how I feel. And, <laughs> and I'm not sympathetic to him. Uh, he, he's made his own bed, but as an American citizen, you really get tired of this, this back and forth. And I don't no, think it's helpful. I, I, I totally agree with you. And it's all gotcha. Every bit of it's gotcha. That Trump does get a get a raw deal all republicans do you watch cnn yeah. yesterday it was literally it was just minute after minute on cnn yesterday was democratic mayors talking to reporters and the question was do you agree with your republican governor it just always happened to be democratic mayors with governors that yeah, were right you know yes. and, and, and particularly so, on true on msnbc yes and so yeah. you always have this constant drumbeat of gas former obama officials and yes you know, yeah. Layla calling in to, uh, ragging on desantis it, yeah. i totally get it but there does have to be a certain point where we go yes those people are bad but the person also should have the responsibility of being more careful with what he says because he does know that he's going to be taken out of context he does know that they're going to that that the injecting disinfectant thing has now morphed into drinking bleach and the and Dr. Box, who's head of the Indiana Department of Health, said they have actually gotten people calling and going, is this a thing? Can I do this? Yeah. And, but then on totally. the other side, you get the New York, uh, there was a report out that 58 people had called in about drinking bleach. Well, the normal number is like 59 or something. It was, yeah. I, I don't have the stats right. Elizabeth Nolan Brown from Reason tweeted it out. And that's... <laughs> Yeah. The honesty that you're talking about is that they make it look like this thing that happens normally is only happening because of Trump. They're completely obsessed with the guy and it's unhelpful and it just cements in his, his supporter's mind that he's the only person to listen to and they must have taken him out of context, even though they didn't in this case. You know, yeah. Well, he wasn't taken out of context, I don't think at all. I mean, he, it was, he was certainly taken out of a conversation. And, and uh, you know, of course, I'm sure you saw the big New York Times article about um, uh, the light, heat and light, which came, right. um, typically, he doesn't actually go to the briefings in, before, the brie before the briefing. He, he walks in and gets a, a few minutes, 15 minutes about uh, the key talking points. It's on a piece of paper. He makes some notes and he goes out and ad-libs after he reads the, the first remarks, and which is how he gets in trouble. But um, apparently this time, um, there's a researcher I can't remember, and from um, it may have been from uh, uh, one of the military hospitals or something who had been doing studies, and they they were directed studies. They wanted them to look at the impact of light. You know, a lot of people take I know people who take their mail and put it out in their their patio in the sun to disinfect before they pick it up again, and so they're testing all that, and that's legitimate research. And the guy um, apparently um, he he briefed them, and then. Someone, I think the chief of staff probably snuck him in basically to see Trump 15 minutes before the show. And so that he's walking out of it with that as his last thing. And, um, and the guy's talking about, you know, you spray Lysol and it disinfects it in one minute and you wash your hands for 20 seconds and it breaks the lipids. And, and of course, this is what's going through his brain. And uh, it's not good, but I, I also think they overdo it and overdid it. And and it, I don't think it's helpful to anybody. No, it's an off-the-cuff comment that doesn't deserve a full week's treatment 24-7 yeah. on the cable news channels. Um, of that, I agree. I think yeah. if I were a Trump supporter or a Republican, I would be very disappointed that every time we got a victory, he shot us in the foot. Yeah, and it, I agree. It's just, it's at some point you have to go, I just can't do this anymore. I can't. I got to check out of the fights. And what that does is that just leaves people that can't handle the back and forth between the press and the president all the time. So they just check out and that just creates an unsafer environment. And, and it's easier for vague conspiracy theories to start creeping in. And, and because yeah. neither of them act responsibly, you know, and it, it's not about picking a side. And I think that's the thing that I disagree with the most is that we always have to, libertarians always seem to come to the rescue of, the right or the Republicans in this situation. And it does have to be a certain point where we have to go, yeah, the press sucks, but maybe he should speak more carefully. Yeah. Well, but I think, yeah. And I think people are just making excuses and, and, um, and, and, and you know what, however, if, if we get out of this at the end of the summer 
with only a mild return or in the fall with a modest return, um, he, he will be, and the economy starts to come back, um, he, he will, his numbers, will, he'll win. Yeah. And, and uh, you can't hope that we have anything different than a recovery. And, uh, but I think yeah, that's, and that's part of what he's pushing. He yeah, wants that's, to, that's uh, absolutely what he's pushing. And, and there's a danger in it. And I think he, he kind of, he must see the danger in that. There's course, a, now the big new argument, Chris, is going to uh -huh. be between the states and, and, you know, the, the official swamp, which is the senators, congressmen who, who actually live there as much as any swamp creature, <laughs> as you well know. And now it's like, you know, the Republicans on the one side are going, starting to think about deficits and can we have $3 trillion deficits? You know, what if we're, we're at the highest level of aggregate deficit since uh, World War II by percentages. And, and uh, that is a scary kind of thing. On the other hand, we have people like Tom Cotton, Republican conservative, supposed conservative uh, from the South, uh, who, what did he propose? I think he was proposing that employee, we should, the government should pay up to 80% of employees' uh, salaries for the next, as far as you can see, until this was over. So, yeah, Holly, Holly, it was hilarious to watch Josh Holly run an yeah. ad online against socialism when he's proposing paying two grand to every citizen for the, I, like, the, the common, there's like a new version of com, compassionate conservatism, which is like, uh, get me reelected. Yeah, common good conservative. <laughs> where where it is kind of crazy. I just watched a documentary on Detroit and about Detroit's rebounding, and you know they were able through bankruptcy because the states and lots of major cities are are basically saying we're going to have to file bankruptcy if you don't bail us out. And what you see in the bailout of Detroit or the non bailout of Detroit because the Republicans in the House and Senate just wouldn't do it back during Obama's era is that bankruptcy allowed them to restructure a lot of pensions, a lot of their, a lot of their, uh, their debts. And it, it led to Detroit rebounding quicker and better. It's just that unions don't like that because their deals get broken. And so Democrats are going to scream right. tooth and nail to protect the unions. And Trump, who wants union votes, is going, yeah, I'm interested in a conversation about it. So it'll be really interesting to see if these states and, and cities do get bailed out. Well, as someone who lived through, uh, remember, in the Ford, during the Ford era, um, uh, New York City was about to go bankrupt and, hmm. uh, and in, fa in fact, did. And uh, the president, President Ford, refused to extend uh, or support aid to New York. And there was the giant headline, Ford to New York dropped dead. That's right. <laughs> and, for which, and, and some would say that that was one of the factors leading to his losing the election because he lost afterwards some areas of, of the state. You know, the Republicans had a much broader um, electorate, electoral base uh, in those days. And obviously we do now, both demographically and, and uh, geographically and everything else. And, and uh, that was one piece of the puzzle. So were there bodies in the streets? Did millions die when New York filed bankruptcy, uh, Rob? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. There were probably more people who got sick and uh, probably some bondholders jumped off buildings. But <laughs> Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's silly. So I want to jump back to the press argument because yeah. this will obviously be something that, that Biden will weigh in on. Yeah. Um, you know, there are sexual misconduct allegations against Joe Ooh, Biden, yeah. a former staffer, the the woman's Wait, mother. what? I haven't read anything about him. And that's the problem is I all know, I, I know about he's him. applying different standards to, to this guy. And there's actually, did you see the Larry King clip from the 90s where the girl's mom called in to Larry King basically saying this is what happened? And so it's all the Bernie bros are uh. trying to use this to get Biden to resign so Bernie can get the nomination. What And there's a lot of uh, Democrats who are hoping to get Biden off of the ballot and put Cuomo up there. So what yeah. do you, Biden the nominee? Uh, I, I think Biden's still the nominee. I think if you, I said last time, I think if he were smart, he'd put Cuomo on the ticket. Just, I, I mean, I like Amy, Amy Klobuchar. I think it'd be great to have a woman. Uh, Stacy would be interesting. I don't think she'd bring anything to the ticket. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I, I have rethought through the issue of Bernie or Elizabeth Warren, but I, I do think either one of them would be more energizing than Joe Biden. But yeah. Biden's got a problem. You know, he can't, uh, he had to be very careful in times like these. And uh, 
what he should be doing is raising a lot of money and spending it on uh, voter outreach and getting people registered and voting early, uh, you know, so that he had some of that in, the, in his pocket. Um, but I think it's very hard to do any of that. So, but you're right, this thing about I, my first reaction, I saw this, what, two weeks ago, we saw the Biden uh, reports, uh, and it's not the first time they've been in public um, in the media before, but they they had about a six day half life, including two or three anguished. Um, how do we consider Joe? You know, is he different than you know than Trump kind of thing? Um, uh, Op eds in the New York Times and the Post and all around by, and then of course comparison to the Kavanaugh situation, uh, and uh, he sh he said she said, you know you you we all have to acknowledge he's a very difficult. And, uh, and I, I think, you know, Biden's excuse, certainly for the touching, uh, uh, which women would call groping, which he called touching, uh, was that it was different times, you know, in, in his day, which is not much older than my day. <laughs> People were a little more, politicians were more, more like that. And, and uh, I mean, men, certainly all of us are, generally in business, afraid to put our arms around the shoulder of a female coworker and say, great job, whereas we would not have that problem with a man. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. So, yeah. So I don't know whether it's real or not. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd say probably 50% of what happened around Trump is real. He certainly used to brag about it. So, uh, but there would be people who would say, well, he would just brag about it, but he didn't really do it, you know, so. Yeah, and Biden's case is not helped by the, pictures of him swearing in people in the Senate and touching people's daughters and wives and yeah. like, yeah. you know, that image that has been, that's kind of been the main, believe it or not, memes on Instagram stories and, and on Facebook and Twitter, like the memes have, uh, it, it's a constant reinforcement of a certain message, yeah. which is why so many Trump supporters were so mad about Clorox bleach memes around Trump because they know how devastating memes can be. And that's partly how Trump won. And so the meme around Biden has mostly been two things, that he is mentally incapable of being president. He's too old. And then number two, he's a, he's creepy Uncle Joe. And so when yeah. you get a story like this, the conservative... It plays to it. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, it just plays to it. And then when, the, when everybody goes, all right, believe all women Biden and Alyssa Milano and the Me Too movement and the New York Times and everybody who was so eager to bring down Brett Kavanaugh are all shrugging on this. It just really, it looks bad for them and calls credibility. I don't know what you think, but. Well, but think back through. Um, I, I think this is a whole, this is a very different, difficult area in general. The, um, I mean, I think all the way back to Bob Packwood, who was uh, a, a darling of the Republican left. Uh, a, a brilliant senator and everything else. I, I, and, you know, he was caught up on exactly this kind of um, um, scandal. And then, of course, we had, uh, what's his name from Minnesota, who resigned, the comedian. Uh, oh, Franken. And yeah. Franken. And he, Al Franken, sort of afterwards said he regretted that he'd resigned. He really wished he'd, he'd uh, uh, waited it out. And, of course, one of his biggest attackers was an early presidential candidate, the female, uh, from New York and Gillibrand, the, Gillibrand, right? And Gillibrand, and uh, and so people, you know, it is politics. We know in politics, people are two faced, and they they are always gauging the impact on their own situation. Uh, and yeah, Republicans are the same way. I mean, Republicans are the same way with with uh, down in Alabama, you know, uh, on that race and. Until the very end, I mean, I think Trump was all the way in there, almost at the very end, to on endorsing this this cat. So, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's not, you know, it just it's going to happen. Um, I I have a hard time imagining Joe Biden attempting to rape somebody, uh, and but I I uh, I don't have a hard time imagining him doing something much less. <clears throat> but I you you I don't think it's going to have any impact whatsoever. Maybe he'll have to have a woman. Maybe that'll you know, me, that actually reinforces that he needs to have a woman on the ticket. Um, I continue to think that Amy Klobuchar is his best choice, but he needs excitement and she's not going to bring that either. Um, and as they say on the VPs, the main thing you need to worry about is they don't, that you don't need to worry about them. <laughs> they don't, all they can do is hurt you. So, so right. he, he's going to have to get someone who's disciplined, you know, Pence, 
was a great choice for Trump, very disciplined, um, scared the hell out of me, as still does, uh, and God knows I wouldn't want him to be president, uh, but he was very disciplined. He's a perfect vice presidential candidate and perfect vice president. So, um, so tr hopefully Biden is doing something. Hopefully this is um, under control enough by the end of May, June, uh, mid-July that they can do their conventions and kind of relaunch. And, you know, Trump's got some of this issue. Um, he likes these big rallies. He likes their impact on the evening news. So. Yeah, that's that's a good point. On the libertarian side, it looks like... Yeah, uh, who's, who are you going to have? It looks like Congressman Justin Amash is... Huh. He has been toying with the idea, and frankly, he's toyed with the idea too long. And now there is a very real concern that he won't win over that, that people have nobody knows when the convention is going to be at this point or how it's going to operate but the, the there's one guy named jacob hornberger who is a libertarian media person i subscribe to his newsletter great great thinker then there's um judge jim gray who was gary johnson's 2012 running mate who's running and he has a dynamic vp pick in larry sharp and then there's vermin supreme the guy with the boot on his head from Vermont, from the Democrats. <laughs> and, you know, it sounds crazy, but he's got a good satirical angle. of, And so I get why he has the support he has. Um, and then now Justin Amash is looking at entering the race. And a lot of people have kind of lined up behind other candidates. And so it may hopefully not be too late because I'm an Amash fan. I always have been. And I think... You tell me if I'm wrong, but people like yourself who are, you know, you're not a libertarian party person, you're, you're ideologically not a libertarian, like you're sort of in the camp, but like Justin Amash, I guess, would be somebody that you'd vote for, that you, he would bring in an independent like yourself to vote libertarian for, I don't know if it's the first time, but probably a solid vote in this election. What, what say you, Rob? Well, I would say, um, uh, you know, the little I've looked at his r record, I, I admire the fact that he was willing to break with the party. And he, is he was technically a Republican, and I am a Republican. But um, uh, what, my recollection is when I looked at his record, I thought he was actually probably much more conservative than I would be on a lot of issues. You know, I'm, I'm a conservative who believes women should have a choice on things like abortion and uh, that the government shouldn't be telling them what to do. Uh, and uh, uh, my recollection was he was kind of, in my mind, on the wrong side of that, but then so are most Republicans. Uh, but uh, who, no, no, Evan McMullen last time, was he independent? He wasn't libertarian. No, 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 no. He's, he was independent, right? He's, he's, an, he's many libertarians, including myself, dislike McMullen just because of his CIA <clears throat> Yeah, I get, I get that, but I, he's actually a very smart guy, and his positions were pretty um, sensible, generally. Um, and and um, then, of course, the Greens, uh, you know, the Greens did really well last time. They did better than they'd ever done. So um, I, think, I think the problem for libertarians is that the brand needs to be kind of, you know, tarted up a little bit. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? I, I, well, the, the brand for years has been kind of crazies, you know that. Oh, sure. That, that it's painted as these kind of crazy guys and they don't want any government and blah, 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 blah. And you, you know, and I know that it's a, a much more nuanced than that. And it's, it's levels of appropriateness and, and, uh, and, and I, my, my uh, history of, the, of libertarians I know like you is that people have a variety of views on both sides of a variety of tough issues. So yeah. it's much more of an overarching philosophy, which I think is really important in terms of government. I mean, that's, in my mind, that's the big problem today in politics is people don't have an overarching philosophy of what government is supposed to do, who, how it's supposed to operate, who, people's roles in it, government, you know. And, and you, can, you can come down a lot of different ways um, as long as you agree on what the overarching philosophy. If you, this is a government, if this is, if defense is, is the national government to handle, then, then by God, they need to do it, you know, kind of thing. And if it's, if, if um, something like opening up on this, this is a great demonstration, COVID, of the federal role and, and in many ways, the brilliance of the federal model that we have in the, under the constitution, which is um, 
the governors really do know their states better and the mayors know their cities better. Yeah. Uh, yeah and uh, whereas you want a policy at the top, the execution of a lot of this really needs to happen uh, at a much lower level where people can understand the nuances of their own communities. So yeah, the, so, the, the eternal debate within the Libertarian Party is destination versus directional libertarian. Yeah. You know, do you, uh, the destination folks just want to say, this is what the libertarian pure philosophy looks like. This is what a libertarian society will look like. This is where we're going. And that crowd has largely been seduced by populism in a lot of ways in the Trump era yeah. that has, has kind of spun them off. Into yes, has the party, Republican Party. Right. And then there's the directional libertarians, the, the Cato Institutes, the Tyler Cowens of the world who mm -hmm. – say, all right, let's, let's look at the policies. Let's start implementing policies or talking about policies and, and move libertarian uh, towards a libertarian direction, you know, so the, it's an eternal struggle and yeah. some minds online, the social, on social media, that, de that destination crowd does so much better because they're so much more willing to do and say things that are populist <laughs> than, yeah. <laughs> then maybe you're Alex Narshwests or however you say his name or Michael Mungers, because they're they're talking about policy and that's just not as sexy as you know yeah. starting online fights. Well, um, I, you know he he is uh, Justin is uh, does have a better media presence than yeah. a lot of the guys who've been running on on the Libertarian ticket. Um, you and, like the guy with the big yellow hat? That's not tickling. Oh yeah, oh yeah, right. That tickles my fancy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, anyway well we're almost out of time so yeah. we've got just a few minutes here but let's talk about uh i don't know if you want to skip dining the dining guide or if you want to talk about maybe some tv or w what's your call well i can't i can't say i've dined out a lot lately you exactly. know, I've, i i i think last time i was saying you know i'm on this keto diet and i'm How's still losing so look, i'm doing i'm getting i'm thank you i'm down about 19 pounds 18 or 19 wow and um, yeah, you know, I told, I'm sure I told you that what triggered it was I saw myself on a Cato TV show <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, oh my God, who is that guy with the pot there? <laughs> that old guy with the pot. Of course I slump when I'm, because I'm more comfortable with these shows than a lot of people, <laughs> but that doesn't help, you know, when you got a pot. So right. it's exciting to get rid of it. So I've been working on that, but um, uh, I tell you what, I have spent my, my, uh, my wife doesn't cook. So. I'm cooking breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week, uh, and that, that's no fun. I, I feel for people who do that every day. Uh, I will say that uh, between my diet, which is you know no carbs, no potatoes, no root vegetables, no rice, no pasta, and I, I love Italian. I'm a great Italian cook, too. Um, uh, there are opportunities to get really boring, <laughs> and somehow spaghetti squash doesn't appeal to me a whole hell of a lot. And, um, uh, but I have rediscovered Chinese. That's the main, you know, I have a lot of cookbooks. So I have discovered that Chinese works really well on a keto diet, but, but you know, the other part of everybody's diet is TV. I don't know what you're doing, but we are watching so much more TV than we have ever watched. It's probably more in the last two months than I watched in the last 20 years in the aggregate. So every night we sit down and watch two or three episodes of some you know, Netflix or Amazon or whatever. And, I mean, Always I just in the background. And I try to like, if, all right, if I'm going to be a slave to this thing, I'll watch a documentary or like I just watched the Gilded Age from PBS or we watched One Child Nation on Amazon the one other child. day. One, one Child, child Nation. Nation about China's one child policy. Oh, it, right. Oh, Rob, it was heartbreaking and disturbing. And you, it's, it's a Ooh. must watch because you just can't believe that this, this ended when Obama was president. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I, uh, I love to see that. Um, I, uh, there's one show that everybody tells me I got to watch because of this farm that I we inherited, which is called the biggest little farm, but, but, you know, we've, we've binged our way through a friend of mine. I did it. He's a, he's a, a lawyer for, um, he, he was a war crimes attorney. He's a professor at Georgetown, um, uh, smart guy. Um, uh, he chases down Nazi, uh, you know, treasure himself, the uh, art, and he he came up with an idea for a show, which is actually a fun show, Blood and Treasure, okay. which is on CBS, uh, CBS Prime or whatever, CBS Extra, and um, we watched our way through. That was fun. Uh, we're now watching this World at War, 
which you know, not World at War, so um, something like that. It's a PBS show, um, which is terrific. It's in its third episode. It's a fiction, of course, and I mentioned before Babylon Berlin, which is set in uh, back in um, uh, nineteen, you know, the twenties and thirties, pre Hitler um, uh, um, Germany. There's a new show that a, a good friend of mine recommended called Fauda, which uh, he knows that I'm. I'm I'm not so fond of uh, Bibi Netanyahu and that crowd, and and uh, more sympathetic to the Palestinians since I have businesses over in the Middle East and get to see all that. And uh, he said, "Well, Rob, even you would like this because it's balanced." And <laughs> I will say it's balanced. You know, it's Israeli Secret Service. They've got a mole and in in Palestine, and and uh, it, it shows both sides. In is that they're good and they're bad? What what's what's that on? Uh, I I think it's on a. Uh, could be Netflix. I think it's Netflix. That, is that the Sasha Baron Cohen, the guy who played Borat? Is he in that? I think I may have started. He may that. be. He may be. But it's it's uh, uh, it's 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 terrific. And then um, let's see, one the other day. Oh, Jack Ryan. We just started Jack Ryan. Mm. You know. And, oh my God, that's actually that's a that's a fun show. And um, I think we're semi binging our way through through that too. So have I don't you? Know, what else you watching? Have you watched Man in the High Castle on Amazon? I, I, I've been told. That's on my list, yes. I have not watched the new season, but that's really good. Yeah, I love, uh, I love the Queen, I think. Yeah, the Queen is the crown, you mean. The crown, yes, right. Yeah, the crown's terrific. The best, and, uh, the best show of all time is The Wire, though. Like, as a political person, that's basically a documentary. Yeah, I, I have, you know, I think I watched, like, two, two, two of it early on because a lot of people thought I would like it because uh, a lot of it's set on the docks. Yeah, um, in uh, in Baltimore, and I, I for some reason I couldn't get into it. I probably have to go back to it. You know, the other one I forgot to mention, which is actually g- good, and it's a British series, is um, is The Bodyguard, mm. and and uh, that was actually a lot of fun and good actors in that. And so, you know, there's plenty to watch, and and of course, you know, now that I'm watching uh, TV every day, I get you know, just for you, Rob, on Netflix or Disney Plus. Well, and on Disney Plus, of course, we watched uh, the, the Mandalorian, which is, that's, that was terrific. I just watched the new live action Lion King or it's, it's. Oh, season. did you? That yeah, was pretty good. Um, yeah. Aren't you a little old for that? Sometimes, here's my secret confession, on a weekend night or whatever, after, or after a long day of reading the news and being depressed, you just want like a Pixar movie, just something on them in the background that's fun. And- <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, uh, I wonder if you have seen The Tiger King. Have you watched that uh, yet? Well, I, everybody tells me to watch The Tiger King. <laughs> and then uh, the last Sunday, I think it was, I was all ready to do it. And then the New York Times ran a big piece in the, ma- in the magazine about the real Tiger King and, uh, and about the movie. And kind of the, the net of it was that, why are you watching this stuff? Because it sort right. of makes him a little bit of a hero mm-hmm. in his own way. And he's not, you know, this, this trade in wild and exotic animals is just horrific. And he was horrific. And, and uh, what he did, and not only with, you know, the murder and everything else, but with the animals, it's just, so I'm ambivalent. Everybody says I got to watch it, including my own daughter, who would normally excoriate me for you know for watching something like this yeah that there you know it's the same as trash tv and jerry springer from a generation yeah. ago it's it's it, there's it, there's a documentary called don't f with cats on netflix <laughs> basically this guy p- uploads a video where a cat is killed and these internet sleuths track this God. person down and it is a flawless documentary from beginning to end and the whole time you're going, why am I participating in this? Why am I giving this right. attention? And they just, they nail that point home. The, it, it's very kind of meta because they are trying to get you to think about watching the type of documentary that they've done and the moral implications of it. It's very well done and very interesting, but it's, it's yeah. like, it's a, it's a three, four hour ride. Wow. Well, so next week or the, uh, two weeks from now, when we come back to this, uh, we will have a couple weeks of Georgia, probably South Carolina, yep. uh, and all that, and I'm sure a fair amount to talk about. And I'm, I must admit, I'm hoping South Carolina is open carefully because I have a reservation at Hilton Head for May <laughs> 9th for a week. 
<laughs> so I'm hoping I can go down and uh, and at least sit on the beach. Right now, yeah. you cannot sit on the beach, and uh, and I'll hopefully I will be coming to you from there. Um, but maybe not. Uh, you know, I could be disappointed. But <laughs> well, we'll sure, we'll have a lot more to talk about. I've got a trip planned for June uh, to St. Augustine, Florida, and I don't know if that's going to happen. So we'll uh, see. More likely than mine does to Hilton yeah. Head. <laughs> All right, Rob. Well, it's great to talk to All you. All right. Good to talk. Thank you. All right. Keep safe. Thanks, to listen. Thanks for listening, everybody. I forgot that, I f- that we were doing a show and not just having a conversation. So, <laughs> everybody for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.